free blacks were seen as a social nuisance, and the neighboring Isle of Wight residents were concerned deeply about their presence, requested their removal, noting that the smell of rebellion was in the air. And apparently, they were right. The next year, down the road in what's now Virginia Beach, hostilities were sparked by a group of 30, led by an old woman, and who knows what story she carried with her as ammunition. The same year, along the overland Coffer Road that so many sold into Georgia followed, passing near Raleigh, Andy's outlaws attacked stores, probably to secure weapons and ammunition. Though not sold, the time had come for 19-year-old Dredd to say farewell to his days in Southampton along the Nottoway River. He and four others would leave behind the 120th that they knew well, moving to northern Alabama, accompanying Peter Blow as they tried to reestablish themselves there. He'd spend the next 12 years of his life alongside the Tennessee River. Two years later, again near the dismal swamp in Gates County, another leader, Harry, was caught and killed. The following year, Nat Turner, still in Southampton, runs away for about a month, but eventually returns. He also marries. The same year, another Turner, from the Nottoway Indians, Miss Edith Turner, or Juan Arunsara, petitioned for individual allotments of the reservation land that was being continuously sold off or materially depleted through opportunistic freelance forestry. Further south, the same year, there is a breakout of rebellions around Wilmington, lasting for a full month. Those mischievous free Negroes were involved again. The leader, General Jackson, or Esam, escaped at the time, but he was later found and whipped to death. Wilmington will come up again, even though it seems a bit at a distance from Southampton. The very next year, in the port of Charleston, another large-scale revolt is exposed. The plan was to kill the slaveholders, liberate the slaves, and sail to Haiti. Its leader, a free black preacher, originally from St. Thomas, Denmark Vesey, was executed, but his name and story lived on, flowing into others as the water always connects. The next year again, in Port of Norfolk, there was a serious subject that deserves to be quoted in full. The residents near the south of Norfolk have for some time been kept in a state of mind peculiarly harassing and painful from the too apparent fact that their lives are at the mercy of a band of lurking assassins against whom their fell or wicked designs, neither the power of the law or vigilance or personal strength and intrepidity can avail. These desperados are runaway Negroes, also called outliers. Their first object is to obtain a gun and ammunition, as well as to procure game for subsistence as to defend themselves from attack or accomplish objects of vengeance. No individual after this can consider his life safe from the murdering aim of these monsters in human shape. Everyone who has happily rendered himself obnoxious to their vengeance must indeed calculate on sooner or later falling a victim to them. Indeed, one slave owner had received a note from these amazing fellows suggesting it would be healthier for him to remain indoors at night, and he did. Over the following weeks, there were reports of capturing or killing of the outlaws until eventually the leader, Bob Farabee, was caught, and it was said that he had been an outlaw for over six years. While Norfolk is up in arms, a young Sam Turner dies. Nat Turner is split from his young family by sail. He goes to Reese and his family is sold to the Moors. The next year, Nat has his vision, blood in the fields. In the summer of 1829, the jails of Isle of Wight County and its neighbors along the mouth of the James River were filled to capacity. The children and teenagers during the War of 1812 were now grown adults and apparently felt that now was their time. 
and they didn't need to wait on the help of the British to do it. The symptoms of liberty were spreading again like a fever, and at summer's end in September, our western neighbor, Mexico, and their Afro-Indian president abolished slavery. You can see the difference between the official portrait of him that had been altered and the one that circulated of him at the time. So, imagine you're a planter or a safe holder from San Domingue that had fled from the chaos and killing and reestablished yourself in Norfolk or New Orleans. What was the political and linguistic landscape that you would have seen in September of 1829? The island of your childhood, the majority black French-speaking island, now called Haiti, is ruled by a general, a mulatto, Jean-Pierre Boyer. Your Spanish-speaking western neighbor is ruled by a general, Afro-Indian, Vincent Ramon Guerrero. And now, you are surrounded, as is the whole southeastern shoreline of the country, by an English-speaking black majority who only lack a unifying voice. In the very same month, Wilmington rises again, but this time it is with the pen of one of its most eloquent sons, David Walker. Walker's appeal states clearly and directly that the hour has come for those in the U.S. to restore themselves to freedom by their own hands and means. It spreads like wildfire and attempts to ban it throughout the South, only push it underground. The following year, David Walker is dead, officially of tuberculosis, though many draw their own conclusions. That year, the area around his hometown, Wilmington, again erupts, more violently and extensively than in 1821. The slaves in the area around Wilmington were becoming almost uncontrollable. They come and go, when and where they please, and if an attempt is made to correct them, that is to whip them, they immediately fly into the woods. It's interesting to note that it was admitted at the time that their network depended on runners and messengers that connected the area around Wilmington up to Pascatane County, Elizabeth City. Essentially, the entire east coast of North Carolina was in constant communication right up to the Virginia border. As all of this is unfolding in the Carolinas, the Blow family and Dredd move again this time from the Tennessee River up to the Mississippi, St. Louis. The very next year, a boy in Southampton who had grown up into a preacher became the Jean-Jacques Dessalines of Port Jerusalem and brought Virginians' nightmares from the night out into the daylight. Awaking to find whites of all ages and both sexes killed, eventually more than 50, panic spread and wild rumors persisted for weeks as long as Nat was still at large. The route they took, the night of the rebellion, can be seen in the link on the description below. One of the boys who saw them that night and hid away from sight would later on to become a Union general, George Henry Thomas. It was assumed that Nat Turner's rebellion had been acting in concert with groups around Wilmington the previous year. Some conjectured that his aim was ultimately to acquire arms and join other Maroons in the Great Dismal Swamp. Whatever the plans might have been, the story spread that the Dwin of St. Domingue had risen again in Jerusalem, and without doubt, Dredd heard of what had happened along the river in his hometown, reflecting on the repercussions sure to come as he looked into the Mississippi River. Wondering what had happened in the reprisals, if his friends and family were among those who were shot and hung. A road was lined with heads of the accused that were sentenced and executed without trial. Had August seen them when he passed into town? What prayers he must have prayed then? No doubt, Eliza Blow had similar thoughts of her own concerning the towns of her youth, but she would pass that same year in St. Louis and her husband, Peter Blow, would join her the following year as well. At this time, Dredd runs away, some say in 1831, others say in 1832, upon Peter Blow's death. Eventually, he returned to be taken by Mr. Emerson, 
And the same year, ships of the American Colonization Society would return many blacks from Virginia to Liberia. You can see the registers online. The link is in the description. The vast bulk of them came from Southampton. And you can actually find out more about their fates than you can of those who had been shipped to New Orleans in the same year. Sadly, many of them, young and old, died of disease. In response to the rebellion, bans of all sorts were put in place. From then on, zero tolerance for reading or writing or gathering, even for prayers. There are interesting accounts of the Southampton Church's internal debates about whether or not to readmit blacks to their services at all. In 1832, the Prince August dies in Southampton, and another blow, Richard, the father of Peter, dies in 1833. Dredd lived on for another 25 years, leaving St. Louis for Illinois and eventually present-day Minnesota, where he would marry Harriet. The same year he was married, abolitionist and minister Elijah Lovejoy was killed by a mob in Alton, Illinois, extremely close to his former hometown of St. Louis. In the same year that his legal battles began, the Fugitive Slave Act was put into effect, yet another of a series of events inviting another civil war. His legal process was aided by children of the Blow family that had grown up in his presence, might have called him uncle, and their spouses, eventually purchasing his freedom a year before his death. Years ago, before I did almost any reading about Virginia, I had always just associated with white men and wigs, cotton and tobacco slavery, and none of it interested me at all. But what I came to find was that the region was home to people who were fiercely independent, who never gave up or accepted the condition that they were in. After I understood that, I didn't see Nat Turner as a singular figure, but as a continuous stream. If Malcolm and Martin had been born only a year apart in the same town, we surely wonder what was in the water. Southampton has that distinction. One is remembered as someone who responded through violence, the other through the legal system. But who knows if it was personality, spirit, opportunity, or lack thereof that led to their different approaches and legacies. If Nat had legal representation, who knows? If Dredd had never escaped Southampton, who knows? Both had grown up along the same rivers, surrounded by free whites chained in debt, rendered sleepless by fear of revolt, by the poor white trash bound by the lack of education and credit, surrounded by free blacks tied by a sense of duty and affinity to those still enslaved, and by free Indians bordered on all sides by disease and environmental exploitation. Dredd and Nat definitely had a nuanced conception of freedom and enslavement. In Virginia, everyone was chained to something. They both grew up with stories of swamps that swallowed hunting parties, storms that shattered ships, and fires that took revenge for those who were powerless to do so themselves. They grew up with stories of those who had taken it upon themselves to escape from that oppressive, humid air by whatever small fishing boats, mosquito-infested swamps, or legal loopholes that provided a way out. Both had been runaways, both had been married, both crest their children's heads, wondering what would become of them. The Nottaway River of Dredd's earliest days and the Meherin River of Nats both converge upon leaving Southampton County, and in that there may be a silent symbol. 